on this uh, important topic. Uh, here are my disclosures. I won't be speaking about any specific products in my presentation today. I want to start with this very interesting and important quote from uh, an older uh, uh, description of weaning from the group in Boston who really pioneered, at least in North America, the idea of an intensive care unit. Um, and this, uh, this quote is as uh, important now as it was then in 1965, the, stating that to know the proper timing and rate of weaning from the respirator requires considerable judgment and experience. And as a rule, weaning should start as soon as possible. And I think really this statement is a nice overarching idea uh, or concept uh, for today's uh, talk and the, and the focus on liberating patients from mechanical ventilation. And I think the other important thing is the nomenclature uh, is that really there's been a shift in the field from speaking about weaning for the vast majority of patients in the ICU to liberation. And again, this is the idea that in and of itself, the term weaning suggests a process that's gradual. You have to build up to it. It takes time. Whereas uh, many patients in the ICU, uh, for whatever reason, uh, we really can look at the process of um, interrupting the need for mechanical ventilation as a liberation event, sort of an acute and abrupt uh, event, uh, much like our colleagues who are anesthesiologists would liberate a patient from um, assisted ventilation at the end of an of a operation. Um, I would say that there, there are quite a few patients in the ICU uh, where we want to consider this as the norm and weaning uh, which is a gradual uh, process that occurs really in a, a minority of patients who require mechanical ventilation. And we were trying to put this focus on liberation and liberation as soon as possible in patients who require mechanical ventilation is because mechanical ventilation has risks. For every additional day that a patient remains on mechanical ventilation, we know their outcomes, including mortality, worsen. Um, and that's also associated with all the other potentially harmful exposures that often come together in patients who are requiring mechanical ventilation. They often uh, receive some degree of sedation and or neuromuscular blockade that typically leads to enforced bed rest and immobility, which can lead to uh, physical and neuromuscular um, uh, complications and morbidity like ICU acquired weakness. Uh, the longer you're sedated, the more uh, chance you might have delirium, which can again lead to poor long-term outcomes and from a neuropsychological or neurocognitive point of view. So. These things, uh, not just in the short term, but in the long term, can cause problems for our patients. So the sooner we can liberate them from this uh, bundle of ICU exposures, the better for patients. And so the focus really, as the initial quote suggested, we really want to focus on discontinuing mechanical ventilation at the earliest possible opportunity. However, um, we want to be careful and we want to use the knowledge and uh, the data that we have to uh, liberate those uh, who we know will have the best chance of success because we, you know, on the flip side, we know that extubation failure within the first 48 hours is also associated with higher mortality. So uh, like many things in the ICU and in medicine, we want to pick the right time uh, for the right patients, uh, but try to be aggressive about the process of uh, liberation uh, when suitable. And really, this has been um, uh, represented in international uh, professional or critical care societies that you can see here too recent um, recommendations from the Choosing Wisely campaign focusing on high value care in critically ill patients and both in the first iteration of their uh, recommendations, uh, which goes along with the idea of liberation from mechanical ventilation. We don't want to deeply sedate mechanically ventilated patients without a specific indication and without daily attempts to lighten sedation. We can't get patients off the ventilator if they're too sedated to breathe spontaneously. So this is a very important uh, adjunct to our uh, plans for uh, liberation. And you can see that in the recent update for the next five recommendations of Choosy Wisely, they indeed explicitly state that we don't want to delay mechanical ventilator weeding unless there's a clinical evidence of need. And clearly, again, linked like sedation is the fact that patients who are um, uh, uh, ventilated uh, are less likely perhaps to receive mobility. And um, so the sooner we, again, reduce these exposures or barriers, then we can also um, mobilize our patients uh, more quickly. And that, again, can lead to better outcome patients. Um, we start to think about liberation from mechanical ventilation uh, when the reasons why we initiated mechanical ventilation in the first place 
uh, are starting to reverse or have completely resolved. So the condition that caused respiratory failure, like the pneumonia, the aspiration, the trauma, the surgery, has uh, has you know finished or resolved or started to improve, and and the transition to unassisted breathing can be initiated. And we want to think often when we're talking about liberation from mechanical ventilation about two separate but related um, issues that need to be clarified before the patient can be considered for liberation. Uh, one is that the patient uh, can protect their airway, uh, since here we're not specifically speaking about mechanical ventilation per se, but tip, when we liberate the patient, we will be removing their endotracheal tube or the route by which they're receiving assisted ventilation, and they need to be able to protect their airway. And the second, of course, is that by removing assisted ventilation, the patient has to be able to sustain adequate gas exchange spontaneously. And patients should be assessed daily for their readiness to undergo a trial of spontaneous breathing, again, linked to those choosing wisely uh, campaign recommendations that the patients undergo light sedation, and we should not delay unless otherwise indicated um, uh, movement. Patients who you try to move towards spon uh, spontaneous breathing or unassisted breathing um, may fail, and usually that um, represents some imbalance between respiratory load and respiratory capacity. And so here you can see in this graphic from a nice uh, review on um, weaning from mechanical ventilation that was posted in the New England Journal uh, almost 10 years ago that, you know, there are things that might uh, increase the respiratory load, like unresolved or incompletely resolved lung disease or pre-existing or underlying lung disease. Cardiovascular dysfunction is a very common cause for uh, liberation or weaning failure and chest wall disease. And, you know, the respiratory capacity may also be impaired. We already talked about the impact of sedation, bed rest, immobility on muscle weakness. And typically as older patients come into our ICUs and require mechanical ventilation, they may already come with a degree of sarcopenia or muscle weakness underlying the more acute condition. They might have diminished respiratory drive. Again, sedation might be a very, um, or incomplete liberation from sedation may be a very important um, uh, reason for diminished respiratory drive. They might have impaired neuromuscular function for a number of reasons. So typically there might be an imbalance between load and capacity in these patients with spontaneous breathing. And some of the reasons that patients would be at risk for unsuccessful discontinuation of mechanical ventilation um, are also likely quite intuitive. Again, uh, patients who have underlying conditions such as chronic heart failure uh, that might uh, preclude uh, successful discontinuation of mechanical ventilation, uh, patients that have other comorbidities, weak cough, upper airway strider, extubation, older patients, patients who have uh, still have high severity of illness. Um, you know, these are risk factors uh, for unsuccessful discontinuation. And again, this is not to say that we wouldn't consider early liberation in these patients, but again, we want to have these red flags in our mind and for sure perhaps uh, shine an extra light on these particular patients to ensure that we're confident that uh, they're as optimized as possible uh, when we consider liberation. We'll talk about some of those uh, things uh, in the subsequent slides. This is just one study from uh, Arnaud Thiel uh, in uh, France uh, demonstrating again, uh, you know, some of the factors that we talked about there that lead to a higher risk of uh, failure or extubation failure in patients, at least in medical intensive care units. And on the table on the left, again, you could see that among some of the significant differences between those who were successful versus those who failed include things like older age, a greater proportion of patients over 65, more patients who had severe underlying cardiac or respiratory disease, um, and higher severity of illness. All of these things seem to be associated with a uh, longer duration of mechanical ventilation, longer duration of um, ICU length of stay, and higher mortality. Again, all sort of very intuitive um, from um, uh, our experience as clinicians in the intensive care unit. And interestingly, in this study, they show that those who, could, who were successfully extubated and continued to remain uh, uh, extubated, they typically had a path that showed that their severity of illness as measured here by SOFA score was declining day over day, whereas those unfortunately who failed extubation um, and required reintubation, those patients did not have the same reduction in severity of illness, suggesting again, perhaps there may have been signs suggesting they weren't quite ready or optimized for liberation yet uh, because the underlying course of their illness was incompletely uh, resolved at the time. Interestingly, dis, you know, despite uh, perhaps the focus on the importance and need for early identification of patients who may be ready to be transitioned to spontaneous breathing and then eventually liberated from mechanical ventilation, uh, 
is the fact that there's actually quite a bit of heterogeneity or variability around the world in terms of practices of uh, surrounding ventilator weaning and discontinuation. And this is, again, just one recent but very um, nice example from um, one of my colleagues here in Toronto, Karen Burns, who's really been a leader in the field of uh, ventilator weaning and discontinuation. And this is a study published in JAMA from 142 ICUs in 19 countries just examining um, ventilation practices around weaning and discontinuation. And there is a lot of data on this slide, but I really wanted to highlight a few things. One is on the, in the table on the left, you could see that there's quite a bit of uh, variability just in the approach to ventilator discontinuation. In 23% uh, or nearly a quarter of patients, they actually went to direct extubation without an initial spontaneous breathing trial. And almost 10% of patients had underwent direct tracheostomy without some other weaning attempt. The vast majority, as you might imagine, did undergo a spontaneous breathing trial. We'll be speaking more about these uh, in the subsequent slides. But just to say that it's interesting that there was this degree of variability across uh, regions uh, studied uh, in this, um, in this uh, survey of practices around the world. Um, and indeed, you know, some of the processes around ventilator weaning and disconnection, uh, uh, discontinuation were highly variable, including the written directives that were used, what kind of daily screening occurred for readiness to wean, the, the spontaneous breathing trial techniques, the, the ventilatory modes that were employed, and even the roles of the various clinicians in the weaning process. And then on the right, I just want to highlight, because again, we're going to speak, be speaking a lot about spontaneous breathing trials, or SBTs, um, and uh, sort of their central role in the uh, process around ventilator liberation or discontinuation. And here again, much like the study by Arnaud Thiel, they looked at the differences between patients who had initial uh, SBT success versus those that had initial SBT failure. And again, perhaps not surprisingly, what you could see summarized in this table here is that patients who failed their initial uh, spontaneous breathing trial had increased ICU mortality, increased mechanical ventilation duration, increased ICU length of stay, worse outcomes as compared to those who passed their initial spontaneous breathing uh, trial. So again, really this study, very nice to highlight the heterogeneity in practices around the world um, uh, in many aspects of uh, the process around ventilator. This is a slightly older guideline from the ACCP, SCCM, and AARC, published uh, nearly 20 years ago now. Uh, but again, I think it highlights uh, very nicely and some uh, sort of concepts that haven't changed uh, in terms of assessing readiness uh, for patients to be considered for liberation. And so readiness includes uh, they need adequate oxygenation and ventilation. And here again are some examples like a PaO2 to F5 to ratio greater than 150 or 200 on a, on a modest level of PEEP and on low levels of supplemental oxygen. Um, they have to have adequate ventilation as represented by a pH greater than 7.25. They really shouldn't have any major hemodynamic instability, um, including obviously no evidence of myocardial ischemia uh, or significant hypotension. We'll speak specifically about this idea that should we be liberating patients who are on um, vasopressors and they need to be awake enough and off sedation to initiate uh, spontaneous respiration and ins insufficient inspiratory. And so again, this idea that algorithm follows this daily assessment of patients' readiness to undergo a spontaneous breathing trial. Um, and for those who are ready, you perform the spontaneous breathing trial. Again, we'll talk about some of the specifics around this. And if they're successful, then we assess for airway protection, as we talked about, which is a separate but related um, concept uh, from uh, uh, su successful spontaneous ventilation. If those are all adequate, then those patients will get liberated. And those who are inadequate or don't um, pass their spontaneous breathing trial or really are even ready at the point of the daily assessment, we continue ventilatory support. And importantly, then need to assess what factors we can change, modify, or optimize so that on the next assessment of the patient's uh, readiness to undergo unassisted ventilation, that their chances of success will be greater. That might involve things, again, like uh, diuresing the patient to improve volume overload, reducing sedation further if they weren't able to initiate uh, breathing or, or cough adequately to clear the secretions. Um, these are sort of some, some um, examples of things we might consider in terms of um, optimization prior to their next uh, assessment of readiness.
In terms of airway protection, you know, it's a simple idea that, that, you know, the patient needs to be able to protect their airway prior to endotracheal tube removal. So things like having adequate level of consciousness and mentation. And again, here, I think they just need, uh, in the vein of trying to liberate patients as early as possible, they need to be able to follow simple commands, like one or two step commands. Uh, they don't need to, for instance, be um, um, having a high level uh, mentation per se, but enough to follow simple com commands, and importantly, so that they could, you know, breathe appropriately, cough to clear the secretions and that sort of thing. Um, you might want to consider the quantity of airway secretions and the strength of their cloth, and these things go together. So we're not so concerned if patients have a lot of airway secretions, provided they have a sufficient cough uh, and strength of cough to clear them, whereas even in a patient with very minimal secretions but really no evidence of, of cough, uh, we'd be concerned that they might be overwhelmed uh, in terms of airway protection and pulmonary toileting in that situation. So you really want to match the ability of the patient to cough and clear whatever secretions they have rather than just the absolute volume or amount of secretions in and of themselves. Uh, spontaneous breathing trials are really the cornerstone of, uh, of uh, testing that we consider when uh, we're trying to liberate patients from mechanical ventilation. And the idea here, of course, is that we switch mechanical ventilation from controlled or full support modes to partial assist modes, most commonly pressure support ventilation. And then we perform at some point when we assess the patient is ready uh, for a liberation attempt to perform a spontaneous breathing trial. And again, this is ideally performed while the patient is awake, able to follow simple commands, and is not receiving any sedative infusion. And we consider um, a successful spontaneous breathing trial, or a pass, if you will, when the patient is able to breathe spontaneously for 30 or more minutes without you know, excessive tachypnea, desaturation, tachycardia, or new arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. Um, they don't get too hypertensive or hypotensive. And you know, clinically or qualitatively, they're not ex you know, having a lot of uh, anxiety, distress, high work of breathing, diaphoretic, new chest pain, new evidence of myocardial ischemia, all these things. So there's a clinical component to the uh, success or failure, and there's a semi-quantitative method that we'll also speak about in terms of success of the spontaneous breathing trial. And really, you know, that the, the benefit of performing the spontaneous breathing trial is that once a patient has been assessed and is ready to undergo a spontaneous breathing trial, the best thing to do is to perform the trial to determine success or failure. Thinking about looking at predictors of what might lead to a successful uh, or, or non-successful spontaneous breathing trial is a bit of a fool's errand. And here are just three examples of studies showing that looking at fluid balance, looking at the chest x-ray signs, looking at lung ultrasound prior to the SBT, they aren't very good discriminators of whether the patient will pass or not pass the SBT. The whole point of the spontaneous breathing trial is a challenge uh, for the patient uh, for unassisted breathing to see if they'll pass. So really, you just got to do it and uh, really not try to hold back uh, on patients uh, to gain the information that we need to understand if they're ready for successful liberation. So I'm going to talk about some evidence-based guidelines for liberation. Guidelines from um, the American Thoracic Society and American College of Chest Physicians, um, and which were published simultaneously in um, in the Blue Journal, uh, representing the ATS side of things, and in Chest, uh, representing the uh, ACCP side of things. These guidelines came up with uh, six recommendations. The sixth rec recommendation on cuff leaks were broken into two parts, but here's a summary of that that you could see here. We'll start with the idea of um, spontaneous breathing trials again here, which was uh, a conditional recommendation that acutely hospitalized patients ventilated for more than 24 hours. We suggest the initial SBT be conducted with inspiratory pressure augmentation of five to eight centimeters of water rather than without, such as with a T-piece or CPAP. And this is a conditional recommendation with of the evidence. And this was based on, again, an evidence synthesis of four randomized controlled trials comparing T-piece to pressure support five to eight centimeters of water. And importantly, spontaneous breathing trials when performed with pressure augmentation or some level of pressure support were more likely to be successful. There was a higher rate of extubation success and lower ICU mortality likely related to the fact that patients were liberated more quickly. And the reason that we made this recommendation uh, with moderate certainty of the evidence was that we placed a high value on reducing duration of mechanical ventilation and again, trying to liberate patients as early as possible and maximizing the probability of extubation success. So the trade-off here was on getting off patients with a slightly less stringent test, we could get patients off the ventilator faster, and there was really little trade-off in terms of 
harms from those that uh, um, that might have failed uh, a spontaneous breathing trial with pressure augmentation as opposed to a more stringent test using a T-piece or CPAP. Some more recent trials, again, also um, uh, confirm or corroborate these uh, findings. This was a trial published in uh, uh, JAMA recently uh, from Spain, showing a very similar idea that you could see again summarized by on the left in the Kaplan-Meier curve that a 30-minute uh, spontaneous breathing trial using pressure support led to su superior rates of successful extubation as compared to two hours on a T-piece. And when you look at the subgroup of groups of patients on the on the right in the forest plot that no matter how you sliced it, almost every subgroup, um, in every subgroup, they favored uh, pressure support, um, spontaneous breathing trials rather than spontaneous breathing trials with TP. And similarly, in this post hoc analysis of a recent uh, clinical trial, again, the idea that on the left, you see that pressure support ventilation, SBTs were associated with higher rates of successful extubation as compared to uh, TPs, and they did find certain factors associated with not being successfully extubated 72 hours after an initial SPT, including higher risk patients who had any underlying chronic lung disease, um, acute respiratory failure as the main reason for intubation, and initial ST SPT with a T-piece. Again, here showing that in their model, uh, patients who had their initial SPT without pressure augmentation had a higher chance of not being successfully extubated 72 hours after their first SPT. And that was retained in a multivariable model that adjusts for other confounders. Finally, I think it's interesting that, uh, again, in the, uh, in the algorithm I showed you earlier from the New England Journals, uh, talking about daily assessments for readiness to liberate from mechanical ventilation, um, again, with a focus on the importance of liberating patients at the earliest opportunity, uh, there's some notion now that perhaps um, screening patients for readiness to liberate from mechanical ventilation can actually occur more than once per day. And again, this is nice work from my colleague Karen Burns sh uh, showing that um, uh, proof of concept that perhaps screening um, at least twice daily as compared to once daily uh, could potentially lead to a higher uh, chance of successful extubation and a lower time to successful extubation and, um, and uh, in these patients. Again, these were a proof of concept uh, trials that are now uh, being conducted in a larger uh, phase three efficacy study. So more data on that soon, but at least suggesting that there, it is safe, feasible, and potentially efficacious to screen patients for the possibility of liberation more than okay. The next recommendation was around um, the use of protocols to minimize sedation. Again, minimizing sedation is a key factor in, um, in um, liberation success. Patients need to be awake uh, to be able to breathe spontaneously and their chances of having successful extubation will depend heavily on, um, on sedation uh, protocols and the degree of sedation. And so again, this recommendation was based on six randomized control trials comparing protocols to no protocols to minimize sedation. Um, sedation protocols uh, didn't lead to any significant difference in um, mechanical ventilation duration, but there was shorter ICU length of stay and no difference in ICU mortality. But despite these, the limitations of the trials that were included, again, we believe that the desirable effects of minimizing sedation from the bulk of the data that were avail are available uh, outweigh any undesirable, uh, undesirable effects. So using a sedation protocol uh, as compared to none is, is uh, recommended although there is insufficient evidence to recommend a specific protocol uh, over another. So again, sedation minimization, whether that embodies uh, daily interruption of sedative infusions or uh, targeted sedation towards uh, a wake calm cooperative patient, um, as long as the overall goal is focused on achieving relatively light levels of sedation in the absence of contraindications, this will uh, have a huge impact on the ability to live sooner. Um, the one strong recommendation we made was uh, around the extubation of high-risk patients to, uh, and who have passed a spontaneous breathing trial to um, preventative uh, non-invasive ventilation. And there's some uh, reasonable data here suggesting which patient groups could um, benefit from this uh, type of strategy where we plan to extubate patients directly uh, to, and again, this is based on 
five randomized control trials of high-risk patients who are extubated to non-invasive ventilation versus extubated to, to supplemental oxygen alone. And in these trials, the summary of the evidence suggested that the use of non-invasive ventilation in high-risk patients led to greater extubation success, shorter ICU length of stay, and lower short-term mortality. So clearly, uh, the desirable consequences outweighed any undesirable potential complications. And in these groups, uh, direct extubation and non-invasive ventilation uh, make these groups include patients who have hypercapnia or hypercapnic respiratory failure, uh, as such as COPD, cardiogenic pulmonary edema or heart failure, and maybe a, a group of patients who have other serious comorbidities. Again, um, this is perhaps not too surprising given that when we think about the use of non-invasive ventilation um, as a primary mode of ventilatory support, uh, two groups that benefit um, uh, from the use of non-invasive ventilation include those with hypercapnic respiratory failure from obstructive lung disease such as COPD, as well as those who have acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So uh, this data sort of complements the idea that these, pa these patient groups can benefit from the use of non-invasive ventilation, and indeed that's what the clinical trials suggest. For, um, you know, again, at the moment, it seems the data is restricted to these high-risk populations sort of using non-invasive ventilation to uh, perhaps lead to earlier extubation in patients as versus uh, considering uh, ongoing invasive weaning um, didn't lead to any benefits. This is the BREATHE randomized control trial that was published a number of years ago. Uh, again, you can see on the left summarizing that uh, uh, the non-invasive group um, really had, there was no difference in um, time to liberation between the two uh, strategies and the proportion of patients who achieved liberation uh, really was also not significantly increased by the uh, use of routine use of non-invasive ventilation uh, to uh, facilitate early liberation. So indeed, at the moment, the data would suggest restricting uh, the use of uh, non-invasive ventilation in those high-risk groups that we spoke of. And then furthermore, again, the idea that rescuing patients who aren't in the high-risk groups with non-invasive ventilation, if they start to struggle after a number of hours from liberation, we at least have one clinical trial from Spain suggesting that in those patients, non-invasive ventilation would only delay the need for reintubation, leading to worse outcomes and those patients should be reintubated when you have unplanned use of non-invasive ventilation in those groups. The next uh, recommendation is around um, early rehabilitation and again, its potential benefits for, um, for uh, liberation. Again, the recommendation here is based around four randomized control trials of any early mobilization intervention versus usual care. And these interventions or early mobilization uh, led to shorter uh, duration of mechanical ventilation, increased stability or proportion of patients who could walk at hospital discharge, but no differences in things like mortality, ICU length of stay, six minute walk distance or ventilator free days. And again, I think here, we would consider early mobilization or mobilization sort of a return to the normal, hopefully uh, functional status of the patient um, at the conclusion or, uh, or near conclusion of their illness uh, that led to ICU admission. So the desirable consequences outweigh any undesirable consequences. And again, uh, despite the, the four uh, con uh, clinical trials considered here, there really was insufficient evidence to recommend any specific protocol over another. And again, what you're seeing here is, is that all these components of now what we consider the A, B, C, D, E, F bundle here are supported by high quality evidence. And they're all uh, intertwined and synergistic in that you want patients to be awake. You want them to be breathing spontaneously. This leads to quicker liberation. This leads, this is uh, interacting with uh, the ability for early rehabilitation or mobilization. And uh, F for the involvement of families is critical. Uh, and so again, this, all these things work together to help get our patients not only off the ventilator faster, but out of the ICU faster and hopefully in better uh, shape. Uh, the next recommendation is around the use of a ventilator liberation protocol. This recommendation was formed around seven randomized control trials of a protocol versus no protocol for liberation. Uh, again, patients who are managed with a mechanical ventilation liberation protocol had shorter duration of mechanical ventilation, shorter ICU length of stay, and no effect on mortality or reintubation rates. Um, again, I think all the desirable effects here outweigh any undesirable effects of using such a protocol, which typically is not very sophisticated or very costly or resource intensive. Um, the RCTs use a variety of protocols, including personnel or computer driven, but again, no, no uh, specific recommendation for one 
protocol over another, uh, probably what can be best adapted at the site uh, it, at which you uh, are working at. And then finally, we have two um, recommendations related to the performance of a cuff leak test. This was actually one of the most contentious um, parts uh, or formulating the recommendations around this was one of the more contentious issues uh, for the committee or the panel uh, in putting these guidelines together. So the first recommendation or 6A was around, we suggest performing a cough leak test or CLT in mechanically ventilated patients who meet extubation criteria and are deemed at high risk of post extubation strider, that's the PES. And here we looked at two meta-analyses that included 12 observational studies with a pooled likelihood ratio um, of, uh, for a failed cough leak test of around four versus past a cuff leak test of uh, 0.46. So very relatively high likelihood of a need for reintubation if you fail your cuff leak test and a relatively low need for reintubation if you pass your cuff leak test. Um, when you simulate using the data of a cuff leak guided test versus no, no cuff leak management, uh, if you fail, you really only delayed extubation by a day. Cuff leak guided test, cuff leak test guided, sorry, de um, uh, management decreased reintubation and post extubation strider, but there was more unnecessary delayed extubation, a nearly 10% increase in, the, in delays in extubation. So, although those that may have uh, failed uh, might, might be identified as high risk patients, it did delay some of those who didn't have a cuff leak but actually would have been successfully extubated again here by nearly 9.2% increase uh, in those patients. So. We, we is a very low certainty in the evidence available here. Again, mostly considered from observational studies. Although the good news is, is that um, members of the guideline panel uh, being led out of um, by Walid Al-Hazani in Hamilton are launching a uh, clinical trial around cuff leak tests and cuff leak test guided management uh, for liberation. So hopefully we'll have higher quality and more rigorous evidence around this soon. Um, related to the performance of cuff leak tests is the idea of what to do if they fail and should they, uh, if, and if they're otherwise ready for extubation, should they receive systemic steroids? And our recommendation was for adults who have failed a cuff leak test but are otherwise ready for extubation, we suggest administering systemic steroids at least four hours before extubation and a repeat cuff leak test is not required. Again, moderate certainty in the, in the evidence only extubation. There were three randomized control trials looking at the use of systemic steroids after failed cuff leak uh, test and the use of systemic steroids in this situation led to lower reintubation rates and less post extubation uh, strider. So um, we debated about the advantages and disadvantages of the cuff leak test. Again, we already t uh, talked about this uh, in summary that there was a small absolute decrease in reintubation and post extubation strider, but a very relatively large absolute increase in delayed extubation. And so really the best scenario might be to reserve cuff leak testing for patients at high risk of post extubation strider. Uh, these might include patients with traumatic intubation, those who were intubated for longer, those who were intubated with a larger endotracheal tube, which might lead to more inflammation and then more risk for strider, female patients seen at higher risk, and those reintubated after unplanned extubation. So those who might have self-extubated and then required reintubation again with the idea that there might have been some focal cord trauma leading to inflammation or swelling. Um, the balance of the benefits and downsides were clear with short duration systemic steroids. Um, it seemed that uh, the data was in favor of the use of systemic steroids for those uh, who failed their cuff leak test and there's no need for a repeat cuff leak test after the use of steroids. Again, a bit challenging the data uh, and clinical trials looking at steroids used a variety of formulations and doses and durations, um, but 24 hours of moderate dose steroids seem to work in most trials. And again, I just highlight that our colleagues here in um, Canada are launching a global uh, trial and uh, survey that will better delineate uh, the importance or role of cuff leak test guided management in these patients. And we look forward to some answers in the near future. So I wanna finish off with some additional considerations, um, sort of like a potpourri, if you will, of uh, things to think about when we're considering ventilation. One is again, like what do we do when we perform a spontaneous bleeding trial, we discuss some of the markers or clinical features that might um, suggest failure, like hemodynamic instability, new arrhythmia or tachycardia, desaturation, these sorts of things. Um, 
many uh, centers are likely also using uh, a relatively quantitative interpretation, uh, um, uh, such as the Rapid Shallow Bleeding Index or RSVI, uh, to uh, determine whether or not patients uh, pass or fail the spontaneous breathing trial. It's interesting that uh, the Rapid Shallow Breathing Index uh, or the Yang Tobin Index, uh, which was um, developed by um, Tobin and Yang, was originally actually to look at whether a patient was ready to be transitioned to spontaneous breathing. So in the first minutes when they were removed from ventilatory support, if their uh, rapid shallow breathing index was high, then the, maybe they weren't ready for a spontaneous breathing trial or a transition to spontaneous breathing. That was its original use. It's now been adapted to actually predict successful extubation. And here is a meta-analysis, again, from our colleagues here in Toronto, led by Batsil Trevedi, showing that it has reasonable uh, sensitivity and specificity uh, to predict um, uh, extubation success. Um, um, but as a standalone test, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, cha it's challenging uh, to use alone, although at the moment, outside of combining that with clinical assessment, um, uh, this would actually be the, one of the main um, uh, procedures that clinicians are using to decide extubation failure of success, success when performing spontaneous uh, breathing trials. Of course, given the moderate sensitivity and, and relatively poor specificity, at least identified here in this meta-analysis, has led to the idea that perhaps new markers, um, either alone or in combination with something like the RSPI, and so studies such as this, like using the ventilatory ratio um, as a threshold for unassisted breathing uh, might, be, might be useful. And so again, this idea that at least in this uh, small exploratory study that uh, changes in ventilatory ratio um, greater or less than two might predict um, extubation success or failure. So again, perhaps the idea of using other um, thresholds could be useful. And again, studies looking at other markers such as P.01 or occlusion pressure also um, have been performed. And so again, it's suggesting that perhaps any one of these factors in isolation may not have sufficient sensitivity and specificity uh, to be the gold standard for determining success of spontaneous breathing or um, extubation failure. However, uh, perhaps some combination of these um, these uh, parameters uh, together uh, might might be might be uh, more useful in discriminating between extubation failure and success. Uh, we'll need some prospective uh, trials to help determine the efficacy of such a strategy. Uh, interestingly, um, and may, perhaps confirming at least my clinical bias was the idea that. Again, that extubating patients who are on vasopressors was really um, a relatively safe uh, practice and certainly something that uh, I perform in my ICU daily, although many uh, initial sort of expert recommendations or guidelines suggest that patients should not be on uh, anything but very low doses of vasopressor support to consider liberation from mechanical ventilation. This is a study published in the Blue Journal, which is currently in press, that showed that um, extubation on vasopressors was not significantly associated with increased risk of reintubation. But of course, these patients are, are a higher um, risk group, so they had increased mortality uh, as compared to those who were liberated who weren't on vasopressors, uh, as well as an increased time to hospital discharge. Uh, there was some effect modification by vasopressor dose at extubation, so high dose pressors represented as norepinephrine equivalents of greater than 0.1 mics per kilo per minute was associated with greater hazard of reintubation. So the higher the dose of vasopressors you're on, the greater the risk. Uh, but low dose vasopressors, less than 0.1 mics per kilo per minute was associated with lower mortality and shorter ICU length of stay um, uh, amongst those that were extubated. And really no difference in reintubation or hospital length of stay as compared to low, no vasopressors. So I think some reassuring data suggesting that um, extubation on relatively low doses of vasopressors is a safe practice that can actually, again, facilitate shorter duration of uh, mechanical ventilation overall and ICU length of stay and liberating those patients is not, um, it shouldn't be problematic in the absence of other contraindications. There's a lot of um, um, interest, uh, again, in the idea of uh, using 
alternative modes or non-invasive modes of respiratory support to um, perhaps uh, prevent or mitigate extubation failure after liberation from invasive mechanical ventilation and certainly uh, even before the pandemic and I would say perhaps spurred on by the use of things like high flow oxygen during the pandemic that this has become uh, an important avenue of investigation. Um, high flow nasal oxygen or high flow oxygen is uh, very attractive in the way that it seems to be better tolerated by patients. The interface is uh, easier to use and apply um, and doesn't preclude things like uh, communication, oral diet, and these sorts of things in many patients. Uh, so a very attractive option if it's efficacious in helping to prevent or mitigate extubation failure in, in certain patient groups. Um, and so uh, from this study here, again, what you could see is, is that um, uh, nasal high flow seemed to lead to better physiologic parameters as compared to patients that were just extubated to venturi mask or supplemental oxygen. So higher PF ratio, uh, better oxygen saturations. Um, they seem to have lower respiratory rate and lower uh, CO2. Uh, discomfort from the uh, interface or related to dryness was better in the nasal high flow group. Uh, again, this is a small study, not powered for um, uh, clinical outcomes per se, but there was a significant difference in the need for um, endotracheal intubation, uh, which was far or significantly lower in the um, nasal high flow group. So again, suggestive data that nasal high flow has a role to play um, uh, in these patients. Specifically for post ex in another study of post activation high flow of use versus non invasive ventilation rather than just conventional oxygen therapy. Again, um, we just have to be cautious because in this uh, randomized tri trial it showed actually that reintubation uh, rates were higher amongst patients who received high flow uh, oxygen as compared to non invasive ventilation, although the mortality was not significantly uh, different. So again, we need to uh, some more clarity perhaps around the specific patients, uh, groups that might benefit uh, from high flow oxygen therapy as opposed to non-invasive ventilation. And indeed, trials that show the combination of the two um, might be more useful so that in this trial that compared high flow nasal oxygen uh, in the post extubation setting as compared to high flow nasal oxygen uh, alternating with non-invasive ventilation, it seemed that the combination of the two uh, led to a, redu a significant reduction in the need for reintubation and that was the most traumatic amongst patients who were hypercapnic as compared to those who were non-hypercapnic. Uh, so again, I think these are, all of these results are, are um, interesting and suggesting, again, specific roles for these non-invasive methods of respiratory support, whether it's high flow oxygen or non-invasive ventilation or some combination of the two, and perhaps future clinical trials will help better delineate which specific patient populations or high-risk patients may benefit from one strategy or the other, or indeed which populations may benefit from a combination of the two. What I would say is that the data suggests again that restricting the use of these modalities to high-risk patients uh, at, high risk, at higher risk of excavation failure is really the key um, target at the moment and the routine application of these um, of these uh, methods of non-invasive support does not seem to be supported by the data, i.e. Many patients, again, in our paradigm of liberating uh, patients as soon as possible, many of our patients will um, do just fine being liberated to supplemental oxygen as needed. Um, and really, we're talking about a focus on high risk groups that might benefit from mitigating extubation failure with one or more of these non invasive strategies. Finally, I want to finish with the idea uh, again that uh, we want to be aggressive about identifying patients who are ready for liberation and then moving ahead with the performance of spontaneous breathing trials and then extubating patients who pass those spontaneous breathing trials. And this is the idea of what does what is the optimal rate of failed extubations in a high performing intensive care unit. And indeed, this is perhaps, um, and this is a nice uh, commentary that was published uh, again almost 10 years ago, showing the distribution of um, fail, uh, extubation failure rates across a number of uh, observational studies in light blue and randomized control trials in uh, dark blue and you can see there's quite a spread some having very low rates of excavation failure and zero to five percent and some actually having up to uh, 30 percent or higher and i think the right answer uh here is uh taking an analogy from um, our surgical colleagues is that probably a high performing icu 
is seeing excavation failure rates in the 10 to maybe 15 or 15 to 20 percent um, rates, suggesting that again, we're being aggressive about identifying patients for liberation. We understand that our testing and our assessments are not perfect. And so if we're being appropriately aggressive, some of these patients will fail extubation uh, despite passing their spontaneous breathing trials um, and getting liberated. And again, I would use the analogy of, uh, again, probably more uh, more germane, uh, maybe a couple uh, years ago uh, with the changing management of appendectomy, but a similar mantra in general surgery that, you know, you're being appropriately aggressive about taking uh, patients with suspected appendicitis to the operating room and laparotomy and seeing a normal appendix, maybe 10 to 15% of the time at laparotomy suggests you're being aggressive about taking patients to the operating room. Similarly here, failing at extubation 10 to 15% of the time uh, would suggest to us that we're being appropriately aggressive about identification, screening, assessment, and then liberation amongst those patients who passed their spontaneous breathing trial. Um, so just to conclude and summarize, I think an aggressive approach to early liberation from mechanical ventilation likely results in fewer complications and better outcomes. Uh, again, the idea uh, is to start early uh, using a protocolized approach with targeted sedation strategies paired with spontaneous breathing trials is uh, an evidence-based or evidence-driven way to approach this. And I think key, like in many aspects or all aspects of care in the intensive care unit, uh, an interprofessional approach here uh, is key. So you really need coordination from the whole team. So whether that's the respiratory therapist, the bedside nurse, the physical therapist, the physician team, the dietitian, the pharmacist, they all need to be on board with the strategy and really the overarching idea that liber liberating our patients uh, sooner rather than later will lead to better outcomes for our patients. Um, we really at the moment, based on the data, want to um, limit uh, extubation to or the preemptive use of non-invasive ventilation to those patients who are at highest risk. And again, those two big categories of the high-risk group include, include those with heart failure or hypercapnic respiratory failure who um, uh, fail their SBT. Um, um, that's where it might be, uh, fail their SBTs or get, uh, who are going to uh, pass their SBT or are going to be extubated. They, the preemptive use of non-invasive ventilation in these patients may be warranted. Um, and again, presented some data that suggested that the use of high-flow nasal cannula alone or in conjunction with non-invasive ventilation may also have a role to play in preventing extubation failure in some of these higher risk groups. Um, and uh, I think the important thing is that at least on these last two points, there's more data coming uh, as well as on cuff leak tests or cuff leak test guided management. So uh, stay tuned uh, for more updates on that front. To finish and thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you very much. Dr. Fan for sharing your expertise and insights on mechanical ventilation liberation. We will now address questions that were submitted during the presentation. At this time, we are only able to address questions that were submitted in English. Additionally, please note that questions and responses may not be relevant in all countries. So Dr. Fan, our first question. Um, so in addition to SVP, and I believe you mentioned this briefly during your um, during your discussion. Are there any specific respiratory mechanics like P0.1, NIF, and vital capacity that should be considered prior to liberating a patient from mechanical ventilation? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. I think it's a great question, and again, I, I think I think the answer is probably yes, um, because no single test is perfect. Uh, RSBI being an example of one where sensitivity or specificity or test characteristics are, are moderate. They're not great and uh, not perfect. And we know there is potential harm from liberating patients who would be at high risk of reintubation. Uh, their outcomes might be worse. So we want to get it right as, as much as we can. So I think along with the clinical assessment and RSPI, if you have the opportunity to look at additional factors, the more that these factors, such as listed here, like P.01, NIF, vital capacity, these sorts of things, the more that all these parameters sort of move in the same direction or reassure the clinician at the bedside that the patient is ready for liberation um, would be useful, um, useful in that sense. I mean, the only challenge to highlight here is that, again, um, none of these in isolation are perfect. and You might get these conflicting 
um, results. So again, like we know that in some studies of P.01 as an example, um, there are overlapping distributions of P.01 for both success and failure, i.e. a patient that could have a P.01 of four uh, centimeters of water, and in some patients that led to success, and in others it led to failure. So um, the utility, again, of any one of these may not be high, but certainly any values that are extreme. So a P.01, say, greater than six centimeters of water might suggest very high risk of failure, or a NIF that's, you know, only negative 10 or negative five would suggest weakness and really not, not, not readiness for spontaneous breathing liberation. But the more of these parameters that you measure the bedside move together, the more reassured you might be that um, liberation is the way to go.